Welcome to part 2 of my procedural sun and stars tutorial. In part 1 we set up a test scene and created the sun that follows a realistic path through the sky, allowing you to set some parameters that influence how the sun impacts the scene. But the night sky is still empty. We will now add a night sky of stars to that scene. We'll start with a basic particle system which will keep adjusting and improving to change the stars from looking flat and lifeless to getting them to twinkle, rotate around and fade realistically. Some of the adjustments are made using only the standard particle system options in the editor, while others require us to write some C-sharp code. Let's first set our starting time to 8pm so we'll be able to see the stars. We need a particle system to emit all the stars. I'm just setting the duration and start lifetime to a large value so they won't expire. We don't want the stars whizzing about so the start speed needs to be zero. We want some variation in the size of the stars so we select 3D start size and set both X and Y to between 3 and 8. This value will be dependent on the picture you use for your star so play around with it. Since our particles will be shown as 2D billboards we can keep the Z size as 1. Next we set the start color. Again we want some variation so we select random between two colors. For the first color we select a faded light blue with 50% transparency. For the second color we select a faded light red again with 50% transparency. We have play on awake on for now while testing the automatic emission but we'll switch it off later when we handle the spawning by script. We'll allow a maximum of say 20,000 stars. You can change this to what makes sense in your application. In the emission segment, we don't want stars to appear over time, rather we spawn 10,000 at once at the start. In the shape segment, we want the stars to form a sphere around our world. The radius depends on your application, but yeah, 800 would work well. I'm setting the radius thickness to zero, since I want the stars to spawn only on the outer surface of the sphere, rather than throughout the volume. We keep the arc at 360 since we do actually want a full sphere of stars rather than a hemisphere. We want to rotate that full sphere around throughout the night. The other settings are fine as is. Finally we go to the renderer segment. We select our material consisting of a simple star sprite. I made mine in Photoshop, a simple form with some feathering to decrease density towards the edges. The other settings again are fine as is. Let's have a quick look at the star sprite and material. There's nothing special about the star sprite, here are its settings. The material based on this sprite has to be set to an alpha blended particle shader. The important part is the tint color, which will set over time to fade the stars in and out with sunset and sunrise. And that's it, we can test our first simple stars. We can see the variation in size and color. If it's not enough or too much variation, you can play around with the settings until you find a look that you like. It's not a bad start considering the minimal effort required up to this point. But we'd like to improve on a few things. Firstly, there's no twinkling. And if there's one thing everybody knows about stars, it's that they twinkle. Or rather it looks from Earth like they're small and they twinkle. Secondly, the completely random placement causes an overall even distribution throughout the entire sphere which we don't want. We'd like to have bands across the sky with a greater density of stars than other parts of the sky, modeling a Milky Way. Thirdly, the stars at the horizon is as pronounced and clear as the ones straight up, which makes the sky look flat without depth. And finally, when the sun rises, the stars remain visible in the sky. They should fade out evenly with the sunrise. So let's improve on our first effort. We can create a nice twinkle using the built-in noise settings. Again you can play around with these, but what works well in this case is setting strength and frequency to 1 and scroll speed to 3. Perlet noise will now be continuously created. We don't want this noise to affect position. One application where perlet noise can be used on position is where you want, say, flames to flutter around slightly. But in our case the position needs to stay constant. We also don't want the rotation to change. We will vary the size by 30% of the noise to create the twinkling effect. Let's run and see. We have a pretty good twinkling effect with almost no effort. Maybe the stars are a bit too red and too blue, so we set them both a bit closer to white. You can tweak this to fit your situation. So let's get our night sky rotating and fading in and out with sunset and sunrise. 
We will add this to the day-night controller script we created in part 1 since we already have the required rotation and time of day calculations available there. Firstly, we need a link to the stars transform, which is what we want to rotate over time in the same way we rotate the sun. Next, we need parameters for the time of day that the stars need to appear and disappear. We use the same way of capturing hour, minute and second as in part 1, namely a vector 3 and set the times to slightly later than sunset and slightly earlier than sunrise. We also allow parameters for the amount of time taken to fade between fully visible and fully invisible so that the change is gradual. We set the default values to 2 hours or 7200 seconds but you can adjust this to suit your needs. During the start method we initialize our new additions. We don't want the fading to take 2 actual hours but 2 in-game hours. To achieve this we divide the value by whatever the in-game speed is, as specified in part 1 of this tutorial. We currently have it set at 2000 game seconds for every real second, which means 2 in-game hours will pass in 3.6 real seconds. Then we'll also need to store the current fade level of the stars, as well as two floats to store the converted times for when the stars need to appear and disappear. If you remember from part 1, we used hour, minute, second as input to make it user friendly, but all the timings need to be performed in seconds in the calculations. So we use our previous converter function to convert the two inputs into seconds and store them in our floats time light and time extinguish. Since I'm scrolling past the rotation section, we can easily add a rotation for the stars as well. We apply the same rotation as for the sun. As easy as that. Now, in order to apply the fading in and fading out of the stars at the correct time of day, we need a function that tells us whether any given time of day falls within a specific period of the day. We call the function time falls between and it takes current time as input as well as the start time and end time of the period you want to test for. To see whether current time falls within the period we test whether current time is equal to or later than start time and equal to or later than end time. However, this will only work if end time is later in the day than start time for example between 10 in the morning and 10 at night. It will not work for between 10 pm and 10 am since current time cannot be later than 10 pm and earlier than 10 am. So we need to add another possible case to the function. We keep what we already have in case start time is earlier than end time and for the other possibility we adjust the formula slightly. Now for example if current time is earlier than 10 pm and also later than 10 am we know that it falls outside of the period 10 pm to 10 am. Let's now use this function to get the stars fading in and out correctly. We first test whether the current time is such that the stars need to be shining. If it is, we let the stars fade in by the correct fraction according to how much time has passed since the previous frame. We cap the fading by 1 when the stars have reached full brightness. On the other hand, if the stars need to be invisible, we decrease the fading value by the correct fraction, this time flooring at zero when the stars are completely invisible. To apply this new fade to the tint color, we need a variable of type color for which we set the alpha to our fade value. You could also play around with red, green and blue values if you'd like to change the hue of all the stars. To apply this tint to the particle system, we need to find the particle system component of the stars transform. We then find the renderer component of the particle system and call the setColor method of the material to change the tint color. It would be more resource efficient to only search for the particle system and renderer components once rather than every frame. So we can move it out to the start method and save it in a variable of type renderer. It seems Unity doesn't like it when I use the variable name renderer, so let's just shorten it. We apply the tint change to this stored renderer's material and that should be it. Let's see how it looks. Wait, I haven't linked the stars transform to the script yet. Let's drag it over and see how it looks. They're fading in nicely and they're still twinkling as before, but now they're also rotating around properly over time. When the sun rises, they fade out gradually. Again, you can tweak the parameters slightly where something is not exactly aligned. For example, we may want the stars to fade out a bit sooner than here. However, after fading in, the sky still looks very flat and without depth. We need some more scripting to dynamically change the brightness of every single star based on its position. 
but we also need to be able to have some say over the position of the stars in order to create more interesting distributions across the sky. Let's combine these two functionalities in another script. We add a C-sharp script, call it scatter my stars and open it up. First off, we are going to define a class detailing a band in the sky. We're making it serializable in the editor and it consists of floats for what proportion of the total number of stars needs to fall in this band and the allowable ranges in the three dimensions where stars are allowed in this band. As inputs, it takes a particle system, the number of stars to emit and a collection of one or more bands into which the stars need to be organized, which I'm calling spreads. Let's enter these inputs in the editor. We link the controller's game object, which contain the particle system and set up a single band for now. 100% of stars need to be assigned to the band. We enter 0 to 360 for the angle on the XZ plane, since we want the stars to go all around our world. For the Y angle, we select only a thin band of 20 degrees, 10 degrees either side of the 90 degree line. Now, in order to manipulate particles, we need a place to store them. We define a list of particles as well as a list of bytes in which we'll save the original alpha of each particle. This allows us to have particles of different intensities or transparencies in the original state, and fading will adjust those possibly variable transparencies proportionally. We define a color32 to work with and will save the radius of the particle system in a float radius. In the start method, we assign lengths to the lists of alphas and particles and randomly emit using the built-in emission module as many particles as is required. We then save those particles in our list so that we can manipulate them. The parameters are list name, number of items and items at which to start. We also store the radius of the particle system's shape module. We will now add a bit of quality control that will prevent incorrect functioning when the sum of the proportions entered into the star bands does not equal 100%. We reset a sum to zero, then run through each band entered and add the proportion for that band to the total. Oh, I need to make the star band classes variables public in order to access them. Now we run through all of the particles and perform a number of tasks. First off, we store that particle's alpha or transparency value from its start color into our list of alphas. Next, we select one of the entered bands for this particle to be located in. Instead of selecting a random number between 0 and 1, we select a number between 0 and the sum of all the proportions entered, allowing you some freedom in the way the proportions are entered, even as whole numbers. The next step may seem difficult, but all it does is pick out which band the random number corresponds to. By running through all the bands, keeping a cumulative tally of proportions and flagging the band for which the random number is smaller than the cumulative proportion. Once we know which band this particle needs to reside in, we draw random angles on the XZ plane as well as the Y direction to define the random location on the sphere's surface this particle needs to be located at. Note how I use the chosen band's parameters and convert degrees into radians. From the two angles, we now need to get to a point in XYZ coordinates on the unit sphere. In part 1 of this tutorial, we used the unit circle to show how the X coordinate can be calculated using the cosine of the angle, while the Y coordinate is obtained from the sine of the angle. When we repeat the idea in the third dimension, without showing the detail here, we find that we need to multiply the formulas for x and y by the sine of the angle that creates the third dimension, while the third coordinate is given by the cosine of that angle. So we can put these formulas in our code. Let's define a vector 3 position to work with. We enter the formulas for x, z and y, remembering to multiply by the radius to move the point to the surface of the particle system's sphere. All that remains is changing the position of the particle, and once this has been repeated for each particle, updating the particle system with the particle's list with manipulated positions. Let's increase the number of stars to 5000 and see how it looks. These random stars shouldn't actually be there, I forgot to switch off the automatic emission. But we can see that the band of concentrated stars is definitely there. Let's switch off the automatic emission and have another look. And yes, we have only our defined band covering a 20 degree arc of the sky. 
but the stars still appear flat, so let's adjust the transparency of each single star. We do this for every frame using the update method. We run through all the particles and grab the start color. We now adjust the alpha of the start color by a certain percentage and clamp the result to between 0 and 1. The adjustment is calculated as the vertical distance between the horizon and the star, expressed as a percentage of the radius of the particle system. So the transparency of stars straight up will not be adjusted, while those on the horizon will be totally transparent. And if we run it now, we see that the stars don't look so flat anymore. The different transparency give it the depth we need. We can now add additional bands to the system for more variety. Let's say we want 30% of the stars in a 20 degree band, 30% in a 40 degree band and 40% scattered randomly like before. This leaves us with a sky with a definite Milky Way look, a bit less densely populated around it and a scattering of stars all over the outer surface of the sphere. We can add more stars, 20,000 is probably too many. Yes, it's a bit too crowded up there now and the edges of the bands become too pronounced. An idea that could be worth examining is creating two or three separate particle systems for some variety in the sky. In one, you could create images that resemble far off galaxies rather than stars, while another visual element could be added to the third. For interest's sake, Let's have a quick look at what happens when you use some non-standard bands. For example, we can limit the Y angle to between 10 and 45 degrees, which gives us this peculiar night sky. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed creating a somewhat realistic looking night sky with me.